After an 80 hour campaign, I just beat Baldur's Gate's new honor mode without a single death in just my second ever full playthrough. In today's video, we're going to take a look at my main character's build and class and also talk about how you can adapt it into your own campaign. This is the Bow Bard. If you want to check out the full campaign, I streamed my entire Honor Mode playthrough both here on YouTube and on Twitch, and I'll put a link to both down in the description below. You might not expect it, but with enough levels, a College of Swords Bard is probably the best archery class in the game, the reason being their Range Slashing Flourish, which is available at level 3. This ability lets you fire two arrows in one attack, dealing not only full damage with each hit, but also adding a Bardic Inspiration die to each arrow's damage. You can combine Slashing Flourish with Extra Attack from Bard Level 6 to fire 4 Enhanced Arrows per turn, and Action Surge from Fighter Level 2 to make it 8. This build gives you an absolutely insane amount of single target burst damage from close, mid, or long range. And because you can recover Bardic Inspiration on Short Rest at Bard Level 5, it's easy to deal this burst damage consistently, fight after fight after fight. As the face of my party, I gave my bard 16 in charisma, but if you don't want this character to do the talking, it's fine to dump charisma all the way down to an 8 and put the extra points towards constitution and wisdom. Charisma can be useful for spell casting and dialogue checks, but the damage aspect of this build focuses on dexterity and potentially strength to deal massive range damage with bow attacks. For normal starting stats, I'd recommend either this or this. The second option lets you add a plus one to both dexterity and constitution with ability improvement at level four, but you do end up eating a big hit to your wisdom modifier. If you're planning to use Ethel's hair, you can take just a couple points out of wisdom to add one extra point to dexterity, and between the plus one from Ethel's hair and your first ability improvement, you can potentially have 20 dexterity by level four. Your race shouldn't matter too much for this build. Most races don't have longbow proficiency, and neither do bards, but you can easily remedy that by purchasing a pair of gloves from the goblin trader at the goblin camp that gives you proficiency with longbows as well as two extra range damage per hit. These gloves are strong enough to be your go-to all the way until Act 3, and by then you'll be multiclassing into fighter, which gives you longbow proficiency anyways. It is worth noting that elves are the only race naturally proficient with longbows, and wood elves specifically have a couple of really nice subrace features for an archer. I personally went Halfling and found that Halfling Luck felt really strong because it practically removes the possibility of rolling a natural 1 and therefore increases your hit chance by a few percent. It's also really nice for the face of the party to pass skill checks. You can also consider going a race such as Drow that have superior dark vision to give you better range in dark environments, and of course any other race should be fine as well, these are just the standout options in my opinion. For class leveling order, you have a few options. The normal leveling order would be to start with Bard, take the College of Swords subclass at level 3, and then continue leveling Bard up to level 6, at which point you multiclass into Fighter, take the Archery Fighting Style at Fighter level 1, the Champion subclass at level 3, and then a feat with Fighter level 4. Put your last two levels back into Bard to reach Bard level 8 for your final feat. 
Another way to do it is to start with Bard at level 1, and then multi-class into Fighter at level 2 for Longbow proficiency and Archery fighting style. Then continue the rest of the build as normal, leveling Bard up to 6, Fighter to 4, and then finally Bard to 8. Personally, I wouldn't recommend doing this because even though the archery fighting style is really strong, you also delay the rest of your build by an entire level, which ends up mattering a lot in the early game. Levels 4, 5, and 6 in Bard are all really important for your first feat, recovering Bardic Inspiration on Short Rest and Extra Attack respectively. But if you do want to do it anyways, this is still an option. Let's talk about spells. For the most part, spells aren't particularly important for this build because you shouldn't be relying on them in combat, but there are still some potentially very helpful options. For level 1 spells, the main standout is Long Strider. Although it typically doesn't show it in the UI, Long Strider is a ritual spell that you can use to increase you and your allies' movement speed by 3 meters without consuming a spell slot. This spell effectively gives your party about 30% more movement for free, so it's ridiculously strong. Other than that, your level 1 options shouldn't matter too much. Tasha's Hideous Laughter occasionally can be really helpful for temporarily controlling an enemy that's otherwise really dangerous. Speak with Animals is good for talking to animals, which while not important for winning, is one of my favorite parts of the game. You can also find a billion potions to do that though. Dissonant Whispers and Thunder Wave can both get a little bit of use as well, but typically they shouldn't really matter. Level 2 spells offer two really helpful utility spells, Invisibility and Enhanceability. Invisibility is obviously great for stealth, but it's also a great way to initiate fights by giving you advantage on your first attack and also making it easier to surprise your enemies. Enhance ability is incredibly strong for a variety of skill checks, typically lockpicking dexterity checks or dialogue charisma checks. Level 3 spells offer a few different control spells which can potentially be useful if your charisma is high enough. Hypnotic Pattern, Fear, and Plant Growth give you a few different methods to control enemies, but with your emphasis on bow attacks, typically it'd be better to leave the casting to a different member of the party. Finally, level 4 spells again give you two very powerful utility spells, Greater Invisibility and Dimension Door. Greater Invisibility is essentially the combat upgrade to the regular invisibility, giving you the opportunity to fire off multiple attacks while invisible by passing increasingly harder stealth checks. Dimension Door is the strongest movement ability in the game, allowing you to teleport yourself and a nearby ally to a place that you can see. This is a great panic button type of spell, where if you and or an ally are in serious trouble, you can just use Dimension Door to reposition to a much better location. This build gets 3 feats, one from Bard level 4 at level 4, another from Fighter level 4 at level 10, and finally a third feat from Bard level 8 at level 12. In most situations, the feats to choose should be Ability Improvement to reach Dexterity 18, another Ability Improvement to reach Dexterity 20, and then finally Sharpshooter for 10 flat extra damage per shot in Act 3. For most of the game, Sharpshooter's minus 5 to attack rolls will make it underwhelming, but in Act 3 you can get a few different powerful bows that are capable of compensating for that minus 5 penalty to attack rolls. If you use Ethel's hair and or a robe called the Graceful Cloth, you might reach Dexterity 20 without using two ability improvements and want some different options for feats. Or maybe you just want some different ideas anyways. The other possible feats that stand out to me are Alert, Dual Wielder, Lucky, and Tough. In my opinion, Alert is the most underrated feat in the game because the massive boost to initiative means that you pretty much always get to act first before your enemies. It's kind of hard to quantify just how valuable that can be, but simply put, getting to act first puts a lot more control over the fight in your hands, and also continues to let you deal damage before enemies turn after turn after turn, potentially giving yourself an extra turn that the enemy doesn't get to have. Dual Wielder is mostly useful as a way to gain plus one to your armor class when wielding two melee weapons. There are a lot of powerful daggers in Act 3 that can boost your stats just by having them equipped, so Dual Wielder is a great way to get that stat boost and add plus one to your armor class on the top. It does hypothetically let you dual wield a lot of other weapons as well, but typically that shouldn't end up mattering in this build as the big stat weapons happen to mostly be daggers anyways. I haven't actually used Lucky personally, so for all I know it might be bugged, but on paper you can use one of your three luck points to reroll a failed attack, ability check, or saving throw with advantage. On the occasional miss that should be really helpful, especially if you're in a difficult fight. It can also be used to reroll an enemy's attack roll, which would be really helpful if they crit. Finally, Tough simply gives you 2 extra HP per level, which eventually adds up to 24 extra HP at level 12. For most builds, that's about a 25% boost in HP, which will certainly make you noticeably tankier. Now let's talk about equipment. I'm not going to say where every piece of equipment can be found, but I will add a link to the description with a really helpful Google spreadsheet that contains information and the location of every unique piece of equipment in the game. The Baldur's Gate 3 wiki is also a great source of information and an easy way to search for gear, so I'll put a link to that as well in the description. Starting with Act 1, the Hunting Shortbow can be purchased from Daemon in the Druid's Grove. 
The standout feature of this bow is the ability to cast Hunter's Mark once per long rest. As long as you don't break concentration or if you save the mark for important fights, this spell can be a huge boost to your early game damage. Gloves of Archery can be purchased from the Goblin Trader at the entrance to the Goblin Camp. These gloves grant longbow proficiency and 2 extra damage per arrow, which is a massive early game boost and they're strong enough to last you until Act 3. The Titan String Bow can be purchased in the Zentrum Hideout after completing their quest. It's an enchanted longbow that also deals extra damage equal to your strength modifier. By drinking an elixir of hill giant strength, you can deal 5 extra damage per shot with this bow, which makes it ridiculously powerful. Another way to increase its damage is by equipping the club of hill giant strength. This club only grants 19 strength compared to the 21 from the elixir, but it also allows you to drink other useful elixirs, such as bloodlust. Caustic Band is a ring that deals 2 extra acid damage per attack. I think it costs a few thousand gold to buy on honor mode though, so keep that in mind. Finally, the last gear piece for Act 1 are Nier's Disintegrating Nightwalkers. These boots let you cast Misty Step once per short rest, and I personally use these for the entirety of my campaign. Now on to Act 1.5, which is basically just the Githyanki Kresh and Lady Esther. The Graceful Cloth is a clothing piece that gives plus 2 dexterity up to a 20 dexterity maximum, as well as Cat's Grace for advantage on dexterity checks. For a small hit to your armor class, you can use the extra dexterity for a plus 1 to attack rolls and damage, until you finally reach 20 dexterity with your second feat. Knife of the Undermountain King increases your critical hit chance and it can also reroll any low damage rolls. Amulet of Branding can be used once per long rest to temporarily make an enemy vulnerable to piercing damage. Now heading into Act 2, Callus Glow Ring is a ring that deals an extra 2 radiant damage to illuminated creatures. It's worth noting that this ring is typically much better on a frontline character who can light up nearby enemies, but it is especially powerful on the Bobard as long as you have some method to reliably illuminate your enemies. Killer's Sweetheart gives you access to a toggleable crit once per long rest, which can also be tactically used to replace a missed attack with a critical hit. Surgeon's Amulet can paralyze a humanoid enemy on a critical hit once per long rest and can be combined with Killer's Sweetheart to absolutely destroy certain boss fights. Risky Ring gives advantage on attack rolls in exchange for disadvantage on saving throws, a trade-off that's typically really strong, but occasionally can be really punishing. Marksmanship Hat gives you a plus one bonus to your ranged attack rolls. Cloak of Protection grants a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws. I never found a cloak that felt particularly valuable for the build compared to this one, so I kept using it throughout the entire campaign. Act 3 has a lot of powerful gear, but the most powerful item here is actually an item worth equipping on a different party member if possible. Ballast Armor makes enemies within 3 meters vulnerable to piercing damage unless they're already resistant or immune. For my composition, I was able to give this to my Barbarian Karlak and position her close to targets to double the damage of both her spear throws and my arrow attacks. It's worth noting that the passive on this armor was really buggy for me and frequently didn't work, but I did find that if I toggled the passive off and then back on again, that it would consistently work for at least the remainder of the fight. The Deadshot increases crit chance and provides ridiculous accuracy thanks to its keen attack passive, which will give you a plus 4 to attack rolls. This passive almost offsets the minus 5 to attack rolls from Sharpshooter entirely, so that you can keep your accuracy ridiculously high even with Sharpshooter toggled at level 12. Legacy of the Masters is just a ridiculously strong pair of gloves, giving you a plus 2 to attack rolls and damage. The Amulet of Ball might not seem particularly strong at first glance, but the bleeding it applies can be used to give enemies disadvantage on constitution checks, which is really useful for applying powerful poisons, like Karabasin's Poison, which both paralyzes and poisons an enemy that fails their constitution save. Gaunter Mile is another bow that can be used over the Deadshot. This bow is capable of dealing more damage than the Deadshot and is typically better for boss fights, but it does have a significantly lower accuracy. Rhapsody is probably the most consistently powerful item across any build in the entire game. Personally, I would typically rather put this on a different character because the increase to attack rolls is a lot harder to find with most other build types. If you do want to put it on your bard though, it can give you a plus 3 to attack and damage rolls, which is incredibly strong. Bloodthirst can be equipped in your offhand slot to increase your crit chance and your armor class by 1. Saravox Horned Helmet increases your critical hit chance. Armor of Agility can give you an armor class of 22 at Dexterity 20. Mask of Soul Perception increases your attack rolls, initiative, and perception by 2. And finally, Band of the Mystic Scoundrel allows you to cast an Illusion or Enchantment spell as a bonus action after landing a weapon attack. This item has some insane potential with a variety of bard builds, but I didn't personally find or use it in my playthrough. The simplest use would be to cast Invisibility as a bonus action after using up all of your attacks in a turn. 
However, with a high enough spell DC, you could also land one attack and then follow up with powerful spells like Hold Person or Hold Monster as a bonus action to set up guaranteed crits for the remainder of your attacks. And that pretty much wraps up the build. This is the first build video that I've made, so if you'd like to see anything different, feel free to let me know down in the comments. If you want to see more like this, I'll be posting the other three builds that I used in this playthrough over the next week or two. Thanks for watching.